Hello. We're going to cover 13.1 in this video. This is the introduction to functions of several variables. Um, and so this problem, this problem set it has 10 questions. Number 11, I believe, is a video. Yes, just number 11. Okay, great. So um, this is the beginning of a new chapter. But we're going to jump right in. Again, you're supposed to be watching or viewing the lecture slides first, which contain all of the information um, so that you can kind of have some understanding of the topic before jumping into um, the homework. OK, I don't ever suggest just going straight into the homework because a lot of times you won't even understand what the questions are asking, really. OK, so. We're going to go ahead and start with number one. Number one says to take this function f of x, y equal to x, y. So we're now getting into multiple um, variables. And the whole point is so that we can graph in 3D. Um, but let's start <laughs> little by little. So for part A, they're just asking us to evaluate that function at this particular point. So then what we're doing is we're finding the function value at this point. So remember, these are ordered pairs, right? The first spot um, is represents the x um, coordinate. And the second spot represents the y coordinate, OK? So we're literally just plugging in 5 for x and 3 for y and then computing um, the arithmetic. Okay. Same thing goes for part B. Um, I don't think I need to do all of them, but I will just for the sake of finishing this problem. So we'll have negative nine times one, which is negative nine. And then C, bear with me. I'm not sure what that is. Um, 35 times 7 is 245. Yeah, 245. OK, then here it starts to get a little bit interesting. So for D, it has the point 4y, which means that the x value is 4, but the y coordinate is going to stay a variable. And so the only thing you can do is multiply those and get 4y. Similarly, now they're keeping x as a variable and they're plugging in 3 for y. So it'll be x times 3, which is 3x. And then finally, in the last situation, this is more so that eventually when we parametrize, um, you're not thrown off by seeing some t's in there. So we have 4 for x, t for y, so we end up with 4t. OK, so not too bad right there. It's not very difficult. Now we're going to move on to number 2. So we have g of x comma y equals um, x, y of 2t minus 3 dt. And so we must integrate and then evaluate. So let's go ahead and find g. By first integrating, we get 2t squared over 2 minus 3t. Or you can just say t squared minus 3t. And then if I plug in y, I'm going to get y squared minus 3y minus x squared minus 3x. So I get the equation um, y squared minus 3y minus x squared minus plus 3x because of the double negative. OK. You cannot see that far out trying to make it so you can see the whole equation, but it, it ends here. OK, uh, that's good. And now we're going to go ahead and use this function to go ahead and evaluate g of 4, comma 0. 
So it will be zero squared because y is zero minus four squared plus three times four. So this is zero, this is zero. I get negative 16 plus 12, which is equal to negative four. Now for part B, we have G of four comma three. So we get three squared minus three times three minus four squared plus three times four. So here we have nine minus nine minus 16 plus 12, which is still negative four. For part C, we have G and four to the three halves. So then we'll get nine fourths minus nine halves minus four, I'm just gonna write 16. Since I did the same thing with these, 16 plus 12. So let's see that. Nine over four um, minus nine over two minus 16 plus 12. And I get negative 25 over four, okay? So all I was doing was a squaring the three halves and I got nine fourths. And then I multiplied three times three halves to get this nine over two, okay? And I squared the four and I multiplied the four by three. Now for the last one. So y is zero this time. And then this is three halves. So three halves squared would be nine fourths plus, and then three times three halves would actually be nine halves. So those are really gone. I have negative nine fourths plus nine halves, which is um, nine fourths. But if you don't believe me, let's go check it. Negative nine over four plus nine over two. And we get nine fourths. Okay, so that one is done for number two. Now, number three, things start to get a little interesting, okay? And this question asks us for two different difference quotients. So let me write out the function first, and then we'll go ahead and try to figure out these difference quotients, okay? So for part A, it says f of x plus delta x comma y minus f of x y all over delta x. So that means that x plus delta x will get substituted for the x. And then y will just get substituted for y. And then I'm going to minus the original function, 6x plus y squared. So this will become negative, and this one will become negative, which will cause those to cancel. So what do I end up with? I end up with 6x plus delta x, oh, I'm sorry, plus 6 delta x, because I need to distribute my 6 minus this 6x that's still there all over delta x. These will cancel. And even the delta x's will cancel. So I just get six is my answer there. Now for b, we're going to do f of x comma y plus delta y minus f of x y over delta y. So I'm going to write 6x plus y plus delta y squared minus 6x plus y squared, the original function, all over delta y. So then we get um, 6x plus y squared plus 2y delta y plus delta y squared. And here I'll distribute my minus. Minus 6x um, and minus y squared all over delta y. 
So what happens is that the y squared and the minus y squared, the 6x and the minus 6x will cancel. And so we will have 2y delta y plus delta y squared divided by delta y. So I do see that every term has a delta y, so I can divide by a delta y um, on the top and on the bottom. Or another way people like to see it is to factor out a delta y. We still have one in the second term. And then this delta y will cancel with it, leaving me with just 2 plus delta y. Okay. And so this is the final response there. Okay. Now, as you can see, that's literally the definition of your partial derivatives. And partial derivatives is not until the next section, but this is basically giving you the foundation on how those partial derivatives are, are found, okay? So now we're gonna go to number four. Number four is a little bit different. It's talking about the range. We may even get into some continuity, but these we really have to think about, okay? So, if I look at this, the only thing I need to be concerned with as far as domains and ranges is really if there's a radical or a, excuse me, a fraction, right? Because we know we have restricted values whenever we have fractions or radicals. And we do have a radical. And since it's a square root, that means it's an even root. And we know with the even roots, the idea is, is that whatever's inside the house must be greater than or equal to zero. It can't be a negative because then you're talking about imaginary numbers and we can't graph the imaginary numbers, right? So we have to see um, what all is going on there. So really that's the only restriction that I would have. Um, X could be anything. It's just because I can multiply a number by any other number and get a number. But if I plug in negative numbers inside there, I don't get back a number, I get an imaginary, okay? Not an actual real number that I can graph. So this will be my only restriction. And so it looks like from all of the options that we have there, that this top one would be my option, okay? Now, if you think of this part as Z, kind of like when we had F of X and we called it Y, right? If you see like this, and you know that this number in here must be positive, then that means that this number will be a positive real number. I don't know what it will be. It'll be some ugly little decimal, right? If I plug in a positive number in there, what will pop out is a positive real number. But I know that this number can be anything, can be any real number. So if I'm multiplying any arbitrary real number times a positive number, what do we get after we've made that product? We would get any real number. So then what is the range of this thing? The range would be all real numbers because the range is your outputs. It's basically the list of all the different kinds of outputs you can have, okay? So even though I'm only allowed to input positives in here, when I take the square root of positive numbers, I will only get positive numbers. However, all of those positive different numbers are gonna be multiplied by anything, as long as it's real. So the result could be anything, positive or negative. Number five. Number five says, z equals x y over x minus y. Now here we have an issue because we have a fraction. And with fractions, we know that the denominator can never equal zero. So in this case, the x minus y could never equal zero. And if I add y to both sides, I'd figure out that x could never equal y. So that's really the only issue I would have with this fraction is that x cannot equal y. And so I would state that the domain is this one, okay? It could be positive, it could be negative, that's okay. They just cannot equal each other because then I would have zero in the denominator, which is undefined, okay? So as long as they're not equal to each other, you really could get any real number because 
regardless of what the sum or the difference is down here, um, when you multiply these numbers, we know that that will never be zero. When you multiply two real numbers, it could be any real number. And then you divide it by another real number, it could be any real number, okay? So for the range here, the range would be all real numbers. You just can't have X equal Y. It doesn't mean that X can't be one and Y can't be one. They just can't both be one at the same time, okay? So let's keep going. Now, number six is they want us to graph the contour maps. So we have f of x, y equal to cosine of x squared plus 2y squared over 4. Now, I cannot do this for you because if you notice in the problem, there's nothing red which means if I do this problem, I'm going to be doing it for you, okay? So I definitely don't want to do that. What I will do is tell you the game plan, okay? So you first need to start off by letting um, z equal to zero and see what you would get, right? Remember this guy is just a fancy way of saying z, okay? So you're basically gonna have zero equals the cosine of this and you're gonna solve that equation. It will require you to remember some of your trick stuff, okay? Then, um, just as a suggestion, because I know I'm going to have to take the inverse cosine, um, I'm going to pick other values that are our cosine values on the unit circle, like square root of 2 over 2, um, square root of 3 over 2, right? Things like that, OK? Mm -hmm. I think that should be good. Um, that should be able to give you an idea of what the equations look like. So once you're done, you probably should have x squared plus 2y squared equal to some number for all of the cases. And then you have to decide what that graph would look like, OK? So that is the game plan. Now I think there is another problem in here where we will have to do it. Yeah, so it does give us another problem where we will do it. So for number seven, we have z equals x plus y. And it says c equals negative two, one, two, and three. And it wants us to find the level curves. So remember, these are just c values. So I'm going to set that equal to negative two, which if I write it in its um, like standard form or general form, it would be y equals negative x minus two. Then if I set it equal to one, I can also put that in the correct form, y equals negative x plus one, and so on and so forth for two and for three. And so if you notice, they all have the same slope but they have different y-intercepts. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the level curves, and they're not even really curves, but we'll call them that. The level curves are parallel lines. They have different, the same slope, but they have different um, y-intercepts. So they are not the same lines, they're just parallel to one another. So it would be this option. And the only graph that matches that scenario is this one. Okay, let's look at number eight. Number eight says z equals 12 minus 3x minus 4y. And C equals 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. And you may not need to do all of them in order to figure out what's going on, but let's see. We don't know how many we have to do. Okay. So for C equal to 0, I'm going to have 0 equals 12 minus 3x minus 4y. 
which if I put it in standard form, these two guys are gonna move over. So they're gonna become um, 3x and negative 12. And then I'm gonna have to divide by this negative four. So it's gonna be like this, which actually changes into negative 3 fourths x plus three. Okay. Um, I'll try to write a little bit closer next time. Okay, so the next one we're gonna say Z is two. So then if I minus this over and add that over, I'm going to have Y equals positive three X and a negative 10, but I'm gonna divide both by negative four. So I get Y equals negative three fourths X and a positive five over two. Now you notice they do have the same slope, but they have different y-intercepts. Is it gonna be the same pattern? Let's go try one more just to see. So I'm going to minus this over, add this over. Um, eight over negative four which means y equals negative 3 fourths x plus 2. So again, same slope, different y-intercepts, right? This y-intercept was 3, 5 halves, and 2, okay? So it looks like all of these are going to be line curves, parallel lines. And again, the only option for the graph is going to be that one. And let's see one that's not parallel lines, okay? Finally, we're getting to something. Um, and then this result should actually help you with number, what number was it? Number six? Yes. This one will help you with number six. So after you do the inverse cosine and you figure out what number you have on your equation, um, it is going to match pretty much what we're going to be doing here. So x squared plus 5y squared and c equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So for z equal to 0, we have this, which is essentially, hmm, if I minus x or minus 5y squared. So I'll have x squared equal to negative 5y squared. Uh, but you can't really do the square root because we know this will be positive, but you have a square root there. So this is definitely not going to correspond to a parabola. But this could correspond to a point because the only way that these two things are going to be equal is if this side is zero and that side is zero. Because I'm going to be squaring this number here and then multiplying by negative five, but this is a positive and so is this. So when I multiply this positive times a negative, I'm going to get a negative, but this side will always be positive. So the only way that they could possibly ever equal the same thing is if they had no signs at all. There's only one number ever that has no sign and that's zero. So if both of these sides were zero, then it would be equal, right? This side would equal that side. And these sides will only equal zero when x is zero and when y is zero. So the solution here would just be zero, zero, which is a point. Now let's go see what happens when we plug in one. So when you plug in one, you can write this as one equal to x squared over one plus y squared over one fifth. And then in that case, what is it? It's an ellipse, okay? And when it is an ellipse, notice that it's longer along the x axis than it is along the y axis. The radius there would be one and then the radius here would be one fifth, okay? Or the radius squared, right? So it will look like this, something like that, okay? Where this is a measurement of one, of one, and this is a measurement of the square root of whatever that is. Okay. Now, let's go see what happens when we plug in two. Well, I can divide by two and I would get 
one equal to x squared over two plus five y squared over two. But that can also be written as one equal x squared over two plus y squared over two fifths, which is also a parabola. And again, the length along the, the radius along the x-axis is gonna be bigger than the radius along the y-axis, but now it's two units. So it's going out even more. Remember the first one was a point, zero, zero. Now, I mean, I could keep going, but you get the idea, right? They look like ellipses. So ours is gonna be um, non-circular ellipses. I don't know why they say that. If it were circular, it'd be a circle, right? It's in two dimensions, but what any, anyway, um, it's going to look like this one. Okay, number 10. This is our last problem in this section. We have the square root of 36 minus x squared minus y squared, and we have c equal to 0, 1, 2, and 3. So let's plug in the first one. 0 equals this. OK, and that actually will become 0 if I square both sides. And then if I add the x squared and the y squared over, I get equal to 36, which is a circle with a radius of six. So it does look like a circle of radius six. Now, if I plug in one, I have one equals, and I'm gonna just square it now. So I have one squared equal to 36 minus x squared minus y squared which if I move these two guys over, I will have x squared plus y squared. And if I move that one over, I'll have equal to 35. Now, this is a circle, but the radius here is about square root of 35. Oops, here, square root of 35 decimal is about 5.9. So it's just slightly smaller radius than the previous circle. Okay. I'm awful at drawing apparently, but it's okay. <laughs> so 2 squared now equals 36 minus z squared minus y squared. If I add the y, x squared and y squared over and they become positive, this is a 4. And if I subtract it over, I'll get 32. So that means my radius is about 5.9. Seven. So I'm just a little bit shorter than I was the last time. Okay. But you get the idea. It's a bunch of circles, the biggest one being at six and then getting smaller as they go in. So it would be this image here. Okay. And they are circles. Okay. And then that's it for this section. I'll let you guys work on this video and I'll be back for 13.2.